Welcome. I've decided not to use the video for the presentation today as it overlaps with the slides. Anyway, I'm not sure having my face on the screen improves the presentation that much. It's a pity I can't be there in person, but fingers crossed for the next one. Thanks to everyone involved for organising the conference and giving me the chance to give this keynote presentation. When I was asked to give this talk, I reflected on what we've had to do at Kenix in the last 20 years since we started as a business using mineral potential modelling for the exploration and mining industry. Many of the themes and ideas of what I want to present come from this experience. Given the marketability of machine learning at the moment, I feel the use of MPM as a standard tool on what we do is on the cusp of being accepted. Or being an exploration geologist, am I the eternal optimist? So the main aim of my talk is to give some ideas on what needs to happen to achieve this goal. OK, so why do we need to do this? Well, the requirement is basically to get from the regional scale, target scale to the prospect scale as quickly and cheaply as possible. This is obviously scale dependent and we need to be able to map the evidence for locating mineral deposits objectively, which is one of the main issues with the way things have been done in the past. Um, and we need to be able to work at 2D scales, which is, is mostly at the regional scale and at 3D scales once we get to the mine and um, prospect scales. So the discipline is in a good place compared to when we started at Kenix 20 years ago and worked with Gary Rains and Bonham Carter to develop the first um, SDM software in ArcView. Um, there are numerous techniques available for use in mineral potential modelling and as far as I can see all of them work well depending on, on how you apply them. Um, GS technologies are, are improving out of sight as are computing technologies uh, compared to where we were 20 years ago. And the most important thing, I, I suppose, compared to back then is the amount of digital data available to, to do the modeling is, is greatly improved and, in, and improving around the world now. Um, we're not only are advancing research into the techniques and technologies, but we have a clearer picture of how we should apply these constrained by our understanding of how deposits form. So the research into mineral systems is, has been a, a real advance and this is continuing. And I think everybody now understands how, how this should be applied and used in mineral potential modeling. New technology and ever improving computer systems now allow us to do mineral potential modeling in 3D, which is critical given ore bodies occur in the 3D space. Um, we need to provide more work here. Um, clearly, we need more data. And this is an area where I can see improvements in the next five to 10 years coming. However, the exploration industry remains to be convinced about using mineral potential modeling as a, a standard tool in exploration targeting and decision making. Governments seem to be much more accepting of this. For example, have a look at the New South Wales um, Geological Survey and the Finnish Geological Surveys, for examples. So the main issues from an industry perspective, which I'm sure you've all come across are, mineral potential modeling has never found an ore body and or it only finds what you know. And this is clearly a misunderstanding how um, the technique should be used in informing decisions in mineral exploration. The software is difficult and expensive to use. This is true. Um, this is an area where we need a lot more work. Even now, mineral potential modeling is not mainstream. And I suspect a lot of this is because of the, the lack of um, software to, to do the job. Um, we tend to have too much focus on the 2D at the moment, um, but this obviously will change as more 3D information becomes available. The other thing is the focus tends to be on process, how to do the modeling, the techniques to use rather than the results and how to use the results. Um, and because of this, we rarely see real life case studies of how NPM uh, has been used to help exploration. And as part of this, and probably one of the more important things, there's a real lack of training at the moment uh, um, for younger geologists coming out to not only understand how to do mineral potential modeling, but also how to use it. It's being able to use the results from mineral potential modeling that exploration needs to, to really get its head around. However, this is changing a little bit with the recognition that mineral potential modeling can be used as a management support tool. For example, the papers by Yusuf Ayetal 
2019 and 2021. So it's interesting, so, and this is not based on very rigorous research, um, into papers published in 2021 that uh, generally publish papers on mineral potential modelling. Um, there is basically no case studies published in 2021. Most of the, the papers are on techniques, um, which just backs up um, the views I've just um, listed. OK, so what I'd like to do now is to actually provide some case studies um, to show you how mineral potential modelling um, was used in the decision making process to advance two projects, one at a regional scale and one at a mine scale. Um, so starting with the Bandara Copper project, and this is an example of using mineral potential modelling at the grassroots um, phase or the regional scale. Um, there was an area identified as part of Kenix's monthly targeting. We basically compiled all the data available in Australia, or also all of the mineral potential models that we've created, governments have created, and we have a large target database effectively. And we look at this every month to see what comes up free and if there are any, any um, prospects available. Um, so an area came up in central Queensland we basically did a general uh, porphyry mineral system, um, mineral potential model to assess the region to, to see if this opportunity was valid. Um, this was based using on, on really basic data available through the Queensland Geological Survey. The area, Bandara, came out as highly ranked, which confirmed its potential, even though it was in, central, in the central Queensland coal fields and actually was a Cretaceous age, and more on this in a minute. So we, we basically compiled all the historic data around the pollutant and did another mineral potential map to actually assess the, the potential of individual areas within the pollutant for, for um, um, mineral targets. We used a local Porphyry model, which I'll talk about the geology in a minute, and the one area came out as, as very highly um, prospective, which became the focus of um, exploration for us. We basically acquired a tenement based on this information, and initial funding was organised, again based on this initial information. Duke Exploration was consequently listed to fund and continue exploration resource development. On, on the project. Duke is still working on the project and all of this was done in, in 18 months of, um, of um, finding the, uh, the opportunity. So what did we find? So, so basically um, this is the Bandara Pluton, this flat area in here. These hills are the Hornfels meta sediments around the edge of the, the intrusion and this is where the mineralization sits and this is the mount historic underground Mount Flora mine, where we did our first drilling and, and the area that was targeted first. And basically, this is the style of mineralization. It's basically massive chalcopyrite with a bit of pyrite um, with fairly classic um, porphyry alteration around it with pretty high grade copper and silver grades in it. So basically, the intrusion is about 50 kilometers around the perimeter and 47 silver copper gold prospects had been mined there or identified there by previous exploration. The mineral potential modelling identified another 56 tar targets, i.e. Uh, confirming that it, it had exploration potential. 18 of these targets had been drilled um, with 15 intersecting significant comp uh, copper mineralisation based on current copper prices. Um, the remaining prospects are undrilled. The area is well located and in the heart of the Queensland coal fields, so good logistics. Um, these are the coal mines which surround the Bandara opportunity, which were, is being explored at the moment. And the real attraction for us, and I guess the people who, who, who uh, invested money in Duke, was the potential for rap rapid organic growth of, of this project through discovery on top of immediate resource development opportunities. 
which was all well and truly shown by doing the mineral potential modeling. So basically, um, the mineralization is structurally controlled around in, within the Hornfels and also with the intrusion and consists of veins, stockworks, breacher zones and alteration zones. It can be classified as a load style porphyry mineral system, but is still consistent with an Andean style convergent model. Um, and major deposits, there are other major deposits around, like, uh, around the world, and these include resolution in Arizona and Butte in Montana, and Stavely are drilling one at Thursday's Gosson in Victoria at the moment. The important thing is they can form clusters of significant tier one deposits of metals um, that can be quite high grade compared to the normal porphyry systems and have long lasting mine lives, which is obviously very attractive. So this is what the mineralization looks like. Basically the massive sulfide chalcopyrite, which forms a series of on echelon veins at Mount Flora, surrounded by lower grade halo of copper mineralization. Um, the resource drilling was completed at Mount Flora um, about six months ago, and a, ma a preliminary made an inferred resource estimated of 16 million tonnes of 0.5% copper using a 0.2% copper cutoff for 78,000 tonnes of copper and 3.5 million ounces of silver. And this is all within six months of listing on the ASX, purely based on the information provided by the mineral potential modelling. So we've just recently completed um, reasonably close space soil sampling around the intrusion using PXRF, which is rapid and cheap method of collecting soil data. And this was done after the mineral potential modeling. And this is a comparison of what the soil sampling shows of where the copper is sitting and what the mineral potential model um, suggested the, uh, the prospectivity of the intrusion ones. They're very, very similar maps. So even without this more detailed data, the mineral potential modeling um, confirmed the potential of the mineral system mapped by, uh, the, uh, by MPM. So this is actually a really interesting discovery in that the copper of Andara is younger than the coal, which I struggle still to get my head around. Um, this suggests that Bandara may be the youngest metallic mineral system in Australia, which has not actually been recognised, i.e. this is where most of the mineralisation in Eastern Australia is thought to, to occur. Um, there is potential for other systems in the region, and we've already seen some like at the Waitara Porphyry, because these porphyry systems tend to cluster. This argues against the general view that all surface deposits in Australia have been found or mineral systems ex explored. Sometimes the prize is right before your eyes if you only look. And that's the beauty of using mineral potential modeling. It helps you look. So mineral potential modeling is a decision support tool in exploration targeting. It can definitely map the measure and measure the likelihood of complex geological processes that form ore bodies. And this can be done objectively rather than subjectively. It confirms geological ideas objectively. The data that need, you need to collect for discover, again, objectively, and prior, helps you prioritize targets and optimize drill planning. Importantly, for junior companies, it provides the confidence to invest capital at the various stages of exploration. And this is the only way that we can find new ore bodies. It allows you to objectively prioritize the areas for more work, which is critical. It overcomes the subjective biases that affect exploration targeting, even, even at the moment, um, and allows the recognition of new and overlooked systems. So like Hemi in the Pilbara, who would have thought there would be gold associated with granites in the Pilbara, and Julemar, only 70 kilometres out of Perth, it could be Australia's first platinum group element mine. And I would like to hope that Bandara will be included in this group of new discoveries. So moving to the prospect uh, to, from, from the regional scale to the prospect of mine scale. Um, this is an example from the Tampia Gold Mine where MPM was used to help constrain um, not only general exploration around the, uh, the project area, but also resource estimation um, once we got down to the, um, to the phase of um, feasibility studies. So mineral potential modeling was used throughout the exploration development of the Tampia Gold project over a six year period, basically from 
regional 2D mapping all the way through to 3D mind scale mapping. And this was basically to understand the controls on mineralization. This allowed us to constrain a resource estimate, which took the project from 300,000 ounces of gold at acquisition to nearly 700,000 ounces of gold when the project was taken over by Romilius. Um, mining has subsequently started in June of 2021. So basically, Tampia sits about 350 kilometers east of Perth, um, close to the township of Narambi. It basically sits within on the edge of the western nice terrain and basically is um, there is no outcrop in the area um, as the area is in, within wheat fields it's all farmland so our first task was to develop a regional geology map to help constrain the mineral system and understand the controls on mineralization this is the map um, prior to the work done at, at Tampia and the gold mineralization apparently according to the Joel survey is sitting in in basically younger granites, which seemed odd at the time. Using regional gravity and magnetics, we were able to remap the geology, what, and as it's turned out from later drilling, reasonably accurately, and shown that basically the mineralization is, is associated with mafic units, mafic granulite facies gneisses, within felsic gneiss package with these granite intrusions and effectively it's a greenstone sequence. So basically the mineralization is the is um, sulfide dominant um, with arsenal pyrite or a bit of pyrite and lawingite as the main um, gold bearing sulfides sitting in mafic gneiss. So this is the unmineralized mafic gneiss. This is felsic gneiss that surrounds the, the, the mafic gneisses. This is the mineralization, and it seems to be related to where migmatites have formed, and the mineralization sits on the edges of these migmatite veins. And this is what a, a, uh, one of the migmatite veins looks like in detail. So we basically collected a whole heap of data um, to allow us to, to, to map the project in detail for, for the resource estimate using downhole logging, uh, including optical optical um, tools which allowed us to turn RC holes effectively into diamond holes. So we had this large amount of data that allowed us to map the geology and also um, map other petrophysical and geochemical aspects of the mineralization. So basically, as drilling progressed, it became clear that there was coarse gold present in, in the system. And this is, this is an example of, of the coarse gold. Um, this was causing problems with the resource estimation um, and we decided to try and use 3D mineral potential modeling to help map the controls on the coarse gold mineralization at the deposit scale and hopefully provide geologically constrained domains for resource estimation. Interestingly, this also allowed us to map and prioritize targets for resource extension drilling um, where we could see areas that had not been drilled that had high potential from the mineral potential modeling. So to be able to do this work, we obviously need 3D resolutions um, in terms of the data and the mineral potential modeling. And this we can do now. Um, the data came from the resource drilling, as I, I mentioned earlier, but also from mine scale 3D geophysical inversions constrained by local. And the modeling was done, uh, was constrained by a local scale granulite facies orogenic gold mineral system. Um, what we found was that the mineral potential modeling was able to interpret domains for the resource estimation. And it did allow us to understand the distribution and continuity of gold grades from the resource estimates. And it was able to predict the location of undrilled extensions of mineralization. So basically the mineral potential model um, and the domains and the resource block grades were tested using closer space drilling to see how well the mineral potential model post probability values mapped the new gold grades based on the closer space drilling compared to the resource estimate. Um, and what we found, and you, you can see this reasonably clearly in, in these sections, is that the resource estimate gave patchy mineralization 
whereas the uh, post probability values suggested the mineralization was more continuous than the resource estimate suggested. And this proved to be the case when you look at the close base drilling. So this was effectively just a, a, a density um, issue for the resource estimation, which basically led us to, to understand that we had to close up the uh, resource um, drilling pattern. So mineral potential modeling can be used as a decision support tool, even at the mine development stage. Remember, geostatistics are used to define continuity and resource estim estimation, but these are not always the same as geological continuity. The infill drilling that we did resulted in wider and more continuous gold zones than predicted by the resource estimate grades, and much more like what we got from the mineral potential modeling um, post probability values. This for me confirmed that mineral potential modeling can be used to map geological and physiochemical controls of gold mineralization, the mine scale and the third dimension. This allows mineral potential modeling to be considered as an option to constrain and help inform the classification results of the geostatistical techniques used in resource estimation for things like resource classification. And remember, this sort of classification is generally still done subjectively. Um, this would allow an, a, an objective um, classification to be made. So where are we at with mineral potential modeling at the moment? Well, it's certainly being increasingly used by the industry for exploration targeting, but mostly at 2D and mostly at regional scales. Um, there are numerous techniques available and the quality of data availability is improving rapidly. But remember, rubbish in, rubbish out. Even if the software can create mineral, a mineral potential model, if the geological understanding is not there, the data is not appropriate, you will get the wrong result. It is now possible to work in 3D, but we need a lot more work on this. Um, the big issue for me, and this came through from, from creating Kenex, is that you require a rare combination of skills um, to do mineral potential modeling. You need skills in geological mapping, you need skills in GIS, and you need skills in understanding mineral systems. These skills are all available, but generally not in one person. So you have to create teams to do this sort of work. With the buzz around machine learning, mineral potential modeling should become one of the most important tools for exploration and mining in, in the future. Neither case study deposit was found directly using mineral potential modeling, but mineral potential modeling was a critical tool in understanding geology and helping make the decisions that led to the discoveries and developments. More research needs to be focused on how mineral potential modeling can be used to support business decisions with more case studies and ideas around integrating business research outcomes. The final piece of the jigsaw is availability of trained professionals to manage and maintain and run these systems which needs to be considered as part of university degrees in geology, particularly those institutions that teach economic geology. And to finish, until I started thinking about this review, I hadn't realized that the work that we've been doing at Kenix uh, since we started 20 years ago is exactly the exploration decision support systems um, that have been discussed in the papers I've mentioned. But we've been doing it in a much more manual and ad hoc way. I now look forward to seeing how this up these ideas can develop in the next few years and to the development of an exploration management system that's easy to use and critically not expensive. Again, I'm an exploration geologist, ever optimistic. Thank you. Any questions?